Amen. As I mentioned in the church email, when we read the story, we are watching an episode of season 28 of this epic story of the Son, Jesus. As I've been preaching through Genesis and taking a Christmas break to preach these texts, you know, we see Genesis as the beginning of the story of the Son. That from the very moment that Adam and Eve rebelled against God, God rebuking the devil preached the gospel to Adam and Eve and said, I want to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed or offspring and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the promise to send the Son. That was way back in season one, episode four, let's say, right? Does that make sense? You're watching Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, Hulu, like, you're gonna, you're like, this is an amazing story. Why do I say that? Because if you just started watching the show of redemption at season 28, episode 4 or whatever, you're not really going to get the significance and the amazingness of what's happening in this passage. Does that make sense? You don't have the backstory. But you need the backstory. Now, I'm not going to preach episodes or seasons 1 to 27 and then season 28, episodes 1 through 3 this morning. But I want to remind you that, that what's happening here is, it, it is, is a, is a long-awaited-for arrival. And that this promise to send the seed of the woman was unfolding throughout generations. And when you get to Abraham, we find that in, in Abraham's seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's not universal salvation, but when all things are said and done, it may feel like it because of how many people from every tribe and tongue are saved and are redeemed together. Jesus is literally the Savior of the whole world in that big picture sense. Even though some will be lost, all the families of the earth will be blessed to the seed of Abraham, Jesus. And then you go down and it's one like Moses will come. That he is God's representative. He's God's prophet. He meets with God face to face. And if you hear his word, you'll have life. If you reject his word, you'll have eternal condemnation. There's a prophet whose words are the words of eternal life. And he's going to lead his people out of bondage and slavery. Not to a government of Egypt, but the principalities and powers embedded in a religious system of works, which is what Israel had become by and large. Religion, not true religion, which cares for the widows and orphans, but this demonic religion in the name of the true God, it's like the calf worship at the bottom of the mountain had invaded and infected the whole system of Israel. Even though God was patient, he was still at work within it. By and large, they had rejected God. And you know that the son of David, King David would come. And so not only would the seed of the woman be a, a prophet, he would come to be the, the, the king who, who would sit on the throne of the universe and bring true peace and true safety and true flourishing. And there would be no end to his kingdom. This coming king who will make things right. But we also know that God said he will provide the lamb. Abraham, God will provide the lamb. Aaron, the high priest, with all these priests, there would be one who would be both priest and sacrificial victim at the same time. There's a lamb that is going to come, but he's also a man. Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord. That there would have to be a man, because an animal can't live in your place, and an animal can't suffer and die in your place. Human sin requires human obedience and atonement to cover it and replace it, Right? And so we know in Isaiah 53 that there was one who would come, who would be the divine son of God earlier in Isaiah. He's the Lord. He's, the Lord sent him and he is the Lord. Zechariah, the, you know, Isaiah, the, you will know that the Lord has sent me. I am the Lord. All that. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep, remember sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This prophet, priest, 
king, divine son of God, sent to be the lamb of God, was going to come. And he was going to atone for the sins of Israel in one day, Zechariah says. In one day. Instant atonement. And he was going to come and eventually come back and make a new heavens and a new earth and make all things right and heal and bless. And it's better than you can possibly imagine. Paul says that, that the glory that will be revealed, that, that all the sufferings of this life are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that is unavoidable for those who are in Christ and will be put in Christ through faith. So that's, that's a summary of the backstory. That's the Cliff Note YouTube overview of seasons one through whatever, right? And so now we're watching this episode together. And, and, and there's in this great longing and crying out and praying for and suffering of injustice. And Lord, where are you? Where are you? Why do you hide your face from us, O oh Lord? And then we have this <laughs> amazing thing happened. Happened. That God in his providential control who, who turns the king's heart wherever he wishes his, in his hands, the king's heart is uses and, and moves in the most powerful human leader on earth in that time and appointed him for such a time as this, Caesar Augustus. And the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, this new era, this new thing that was happening on earth that gave people a secular appetite for what a worldwide empire that, in, in, you know, there was all kinds of horrible stuff about the Roman Empire, but where there was this uh, these roads where the, you, you could be connected and meet people from all over the world more easily. And there was a general peace on the world. There, there was, it was opening up their, their vision to see that this can actually happen on this planet. And God put it in Augustus's heart, like he allowed, like in David's heart, right? With the census, and there's a whole other story. But to have a census. What did, what did God use that for? To get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, even though his parents, or his, you know, his adoptive father and his mom did not live in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. How does he get them there? God controls the heart of the most powerful man on the earth to bring the true empire of peace and justice and flourishing. So that's the census thing. I'm not going to go into all of these things, right? That's one to seven. And so Jesus is born, but I want to focus on this, this experience of the shepherds. So how big a deal is the presence of Jesus at his birth? How big a deal? Let's look at that because we tend to gloss over it and ignore it. And I, I think my calling and my job is like a, like a museum guide, an art museum guide. If you're looking at a painting and you're like, hmm, okay. All right, I like the colors, but whatever. A good art guy will start asking you questions to get you to think about it and look at it, right? And he might start giving you, or she might start giving you a little backstory about different art movements. There's a, there's a narrative behind what ended up with this artwork. There were influences, and there were things going on in the culture in different eras in our country or other parts of the world. And you start getting the backstory, right? To then start, oh, there's a reason that guy put those lines like that. Oh, your eyes are beginning to open. You're learning to see with new eyes. You're like, oh my goodness, I did not know that was there. That's what I hope the Holy Spirit is, is doing right now. You're like, man, it's almost 12. Right. Let's look. Let's behold the glory of the Lord and the word of the Lord. What happened to these shepherds after Jesus was born? Verse 8. Now they were in the same country, so the same general area of Bethlehem, but out a little bit. Shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And, and uh, you know, even though the, the image of shepherd is used for God in the Bible and stuff, shepherds were not, they were like the garbage men, sort of, uh, not to rip on garbage men, but like, you know, some dad's like, oh, you're, 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 the guy you want to marry is a shepherd. Your mother and I need to talk about that. <laughs> we need to have a little talk for a second. Are you going to be able to provide for you? Like, you know, you know, she'd write like, mom and I, you know. Shepherds were not, 
necessarily esteemed. Okay? I've heard that in some situations or some cultures, and maybe even in this culture, you can look it up, that the testimony of a shepherd wasn't even allowed in court. I've heard that. Something like that. So, just like God is kind of into doing, he chose as his witnesses the least likely first witnesses. I think a, a woman's testimony wasn't allowed in court, if I'm not mistaken. And after the resurrection, Jesus chose a woman to be the first witness of the resurrection. He flips things around, right? The things that are high will be brought low, the things that are low will be brought high. What does God do to these shepherds? Listen, verse 9, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. What, what is that evoking? Think of the Exodus. When they're wandering around the wilderness, and it talks about like the, the, when they struck the rock and the waters came out, an angel, now this said the angel of the Lord, and this is not the angel of the Lord, but there's an evocative, there's these echoes of the story and history of redemption. There are these references to season 3 in season 28's episodes, you get it? It's evocative of that. What, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Not a naked reared chair that's cute in Renaissance paintings, but a being that in its holiness is terrifying. Amen. It's not a horror show horror. It's a more terrifying horror than a horror movie, than Walking Dead or whatever. I recoil at that imagery, but there's something that makes you recoil even more than horror. It's holiness. It's holiness. Because we're still sinful. And so this holy angel, this isn't even the Lord, this is a, a representative. But they're so awe-inspiring and so jarring and so shocking and so amazing that the Apostle John himself, in the vision that he was given in Revelation, fell down to worship an angel twice. If I'm remembering right. <laughs> twice. He's confessing that to us. He's like, listen, y'all, this is real. And so this angel of the Lord stood before them, and they didn't go, aren't you so cute? Are you, you are the cutest thing. Can I pet your wings? No, they, they were terrified. They wet their pants. They were, they were blown away by the holiness of an angel, the Lord's representative. We're looking at this painting together, and we're learning to see it with new eyes. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and, and, and we skip over this. Remember, you're wondering what you want for, if Santa's going to bring you the right toy for Christmas when you hear this passage, usually, if you grew up going to church on Christmas Eve and stuff, right? At least this is for me. That's what it was for me. And the glory of the Lord shone around about them. Like, you know, I love the Charlie Brown Christmas special. I hear Linus' voice reading this passage in the King James Version. Like, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, right? But we kind of gloss over it, right? How big a deal is it? That these shepherds experienced not only the presence of an angel, but the personal, special presence of the glory of the Lord. Where do we see that? We see that in the tabernacle, where the glory of the Lord filled this tent in the wilderness to the point that they, the priests couldn't go inside. They were, they were wowed by the glory of the Lord. When Solomon dedicated the temple of the Lord, you know, the son of David, when he built the house of the Lord, the glory of the Lord filled the temple and they fell on their faces, right? That's the same phrase here. So we're like, we think, okay, there's angels floating around. There's sort of this light sort of floating around and it's all pretty and Christmassy and you get warm. It's like, this is the glory of the Lord. God's not stuttering here, right? The glory of the Lord shone around about them. God's special presence may have still sort of been in the temple, but God was going, guess what? You don't have to be in the temple to experience the glory of the Lord. Amen. Like in Ezekiel, you can be in Babylon, in exile. You can be in time out with God, but God will come to the corner and sit with you in his glory with those wheels within wheels. This is the glory of God and the cherubim and the angels and all this stuff. This was like Ezekiel. These cherubim showing up with the glory of the Lord. The Lord just revealed that to me right in the pulpit. Yeah. This is the fulfillment of that, you see? Amen. I am with you. Amen. I am with you. You need the glory of the Lord.
Lord, but you also need the flesh of the Lord. You need the Lord to show up in the flesh because only a true, real man can be a savior of sinful people. And so what, what do we see? What do they announce? The glory of the Lord is not enough to save you. You need the Son of God becoming flesh and to be glorious in our place. Because that's what salvation is. To be true love in human flesh, tempted but sinless in our place. The Lord had to love in our place. This is the glory of the Lord shown round about them, verse 9, and they were greatly afraid. You know, again, they were terrified. Don't, don't skip over that. These probably weren't a wuss if you're a shepherd because you have to fend off wolves. So like, they, you know, they, they were kind of probably tough guys and they were terrified. Verse 10, here's the heart of God. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings. That the Greek is like evangelize. I evangelize you. I'm preaching the gospel to you. I'm bringing you good news, an announcement, like the birth of an emperor or a victory of battle. That Greek word was used in the Roman Empire context for those kinds of special announcements. I bring you good tidings or good news of great joy, not just joy, but great joy, which will be to all people or all the people, right? The people of God, Jew first and Gentile. It will be to all the people. For, what are we joyful about? The glory of the Lord on the hills? No, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, God's covenant promises to David, there will be a son of David who will sit on his throne. David's Lord, who's also uh, David's son. How can the Messiah be both David's Lord and son? How can he say, sit at my right hand? And, you know, this is a, a savior. And this will be the sign to you. Humility, babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, not the nicest onesie that you order on the like mom blog catalog, right? Rags, lying in a manger. And we don't know if it was in an actual stable. Some people say inns or houses actually kept their animals inside in the courtyard, blah, 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 blah. But we know it was not an exalted pottery barn crib. You know, it was a manger where animals eat. This announcement of the Savior, right? It was Christ the Lord and lowly birth, lowliness. It's not what you would expect. They're looking at the glory of the Lord on the, on, in the hills and then they see the glory of the Lord in his debasement, in his humiliation, in his willingness to become flesh and to be born into poverty. Because at that time in Israel, the house of David was not really... Uh, highly exalted. They were poor. So we see this announcement that the angels, what's the announcement? He's here! He's here! Hallelujah! He's here! God fulfilled His promises. That's that announcement. And then also there's not just one angel of the Lord, verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, the armies of God, that's military terminology, the hosts of heaven or the soldiers of heaven, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, shalom, healing, salvation, blessing to the, all the families of the earth. So what did the shepherds do in response to this? They hastened to go see this thing which the Lord had made known to them. They, they were beholding the glory of the Lord in the fields. And all of a sudden there was this heavenly choir concert that showed up. There was this angelic worship service with these angels blowing them away. And then they moved back up into heaven and the, and the shepherds were like, let's haul it and see for ourselves. There's an urgency. There's a not boringness about the gospel and the nativity. You're like, it's 12.05. Sorry, hang in. There's a not boringness about this that we see in the lives of the shepherds. That they're excited to go see. And then what happens afterwards? What happens? 
Verse 17, now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. What was the response? Verse 18, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which we were told by them by the shepherds. We are so inoculated to the glory and amazingness and not boringness of this. And it's only by the Holy Spirit that God can open our eyes to behold the glory of the Lord. Now, what do you do with this? Right? We've been in Bethlehem a little bit, right? On the, on the, on the hills with the shepherds in Bethlehem, we're looking at this painting of what, what, so what? <laughs> well, he's here means something else. As I was praying, what do you do with this? Can you connect the power and the glory and the excitement of the announcement of the arrival of the promised seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, son of David, son of God, servant of the Lord. Can you connect the Christmas magic excitement thing that's in this scene with your daily life? And with what's happened this morning, even if you're kind of nodding off, you know? Can you connect these things? The Spirit does. Because what does it mean when I say, He's here? What, what else does that mean? It's not just the birth of the Savior. You know what Jesus said to his disciples? It is better for you that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come to you. Whoa. What else does Jesus say, church? He says, where there are two or more gathered together, obviously, in his name, in faith in him, what? There am I in the midst of you. What else does the Lord say? This is the great mystery, Christ in you. What? Why are we a church? Because God has chosen to, to display his glory in the church by Jesus Christ, Ephesians tell us, to mock the principalities and powers who had claimed the Gentile nations for themselves, to whom the, na the, uh, for, to whom the nations have been given over in judgment, these fallen angelic beings, that's real, and Jesus says, oh, I'm taking them back. Woo! Look how I can bring people from many nations together into one nation, into one family of God. Look at the glory of the Lord and the love of the body of Christ. He's here. Jesus said in Revelation, tells us in Revelation that he's walking among the lampstands. We're a lampstand. These were individual messed up churches in Asia in the Roman Empire, actual local congregations or networks of congregations, and Jesus is like, I'm still walking among you. I'm still in your midst. And I'll tell you what, if there are only two or three left, guess what? I'm still walking among you. I'm still in your midst. I'm in you individually, yes, right? Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. You're like, what? Hold on. But the life I, okay, so he's still living in another way. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The gospel of Christ's sacrificial love is his daily drink. It's his cereal. It's his hamburger. It's his steak dinner. You can tell what I, what I like. He's eating God's love through gospel faith. And we can know the presence of Christ in our own hearts. Ephesians, Paul says, I'm praying that that, that the Spirit would give you the strength, not just individually, but especially as a group of believers, that the Lord would strengthen you by His Spirit and in your inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Well, isn't Christ dwelling in our heart by faith? Yes, He is, but we want to behold this Christmas glory, not just of the incarnation, but the greatest Christmas gift is Pentecost, y'all. It's the Holy Spirit. God sent His Son so He could give us His Spirit. And so practicing the presence of Christ, being aware that when you say amen, Jesus doesn't fly away from you, and God doesn't hang up the phone when you say amen, when you're praying that Jesus is always with you, and that where two or more are gathered together, we don't see angels, but God tells us in his word that, that the whole head covering, whatever, however we apply that, because of the angels who are hanging out in your worship, think about this, like, you're like, yeah, I'm going to church, whatever. Oh, there's like 20 people here, whatever. Oh, what's going on? The angels are among us, looking in. Amen. And guess what? Who's, who's seeing glory now? The angels are beholding 
the glory of the Lord as we announce in our songs and our preaching and our prayers the good tidings of great joy. Amen. You see that? May God open our eyes to behold our Savior, not just in Bethlehem, but, but in the Holy of Holies, seated at the right hand of God, and yet walking among the lampstands. And Jesus said, And lo, behold, I will be with you always. He is here. There is no time in your daily life where you cannot say, He is here because He loves me and He saved me and He will never leave me nor forsake me. He is here. Praise Jesus. It's better. Father, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us to, to sing Heart the Herald Angels Sing a cappella, <laughs> just the first verse. Heart the Herald Angels Sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise 